Welcome to episode two of Essential Conversations. Uh, today's conversation is around Casablanca. Perhaps I, a movie I consider essential, and I think most people, especially probably film professors and film historians in general, consider essential. So that'll be the movie we're discussing today. I, I have seen it before. Ion has not. Ion is my guest today. And uh, the first question I had for you is, where are you coming at this movie from? Are you? you I, I know you haven't seen any noir movies before, mm -hmm. but you, have you seen many black and white movies? How do you feel about old Hollywood? I know very little about old Hollywood, okay. and I think all the experience I have with like noir or neo noir is references from Archer. So I've okay. had very little experience. <laughs> okay, and then how do you feel? Because I feel like if you've had very little experience walking into this movie, which is probably quintessential peak old Hollywood. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about it, like stylistically more than uh, thematic wise? I thought stylistically it was really nice. I thought the. It was just a very colorful cast of characters from a lot of different places, and it kind of had this melting pot feeling. It felt. Uh, you were meaning like more metaphorical, not no, 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 that? No, 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 not metaphorical. If, if some of it felt kind of metaphorical, like the different characters representing something else. Okay. Um, so I might be wrong. So, how, so, how, do you, how do you see the metaphorical angle? Um, the I, idea, I think part of the idea uh, of like Americans being isolationist at the beginning mm -hmm. of World War II kind of played into Rick's character. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I think that was majorly written into his character. Well, they have the whole bit about him being neutral the whole time, and then as he starts to get, become more and more involved in the war, it becomes a better and better thing that he's getting more and more involved. So mm -hmm. it seems to be a very direct ploy, like, look at Americans, they're just sitting out being neutral, profiting. Right. We need to step in and do something, because look, at, we, we managed to save the whole war. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, something, uh, there's a line along those lines at the end with someone about, like, if you'd only stepped in sooner. Yeah. And, uh, or no, it was the, um, I feel good about our chances now, or whatever, about yeah. winning the war. So it feels like, yeah, it's very much, a, it's, a, it's a piece of propaganda a little bit. Yeah. More than a little bit. It is it was a, piece a fun of piece of propaganda. It was a fun piece of propaganda. I thought uh. stylistically it was very well done. Uh, there were some of the shots, like I mentioned during the movie, some of the shots weren't consistent between uh, shots like the editing, and it was just obvious they didn't have enough time to film it or they missed something. But as you mentioned, that was just a thing of the era. Yeah, especially f filming on film and like getting the right mm -hmm. takes and it's like oh we can't do another take it costs more money. Now the take you don't always you wouldn't see the um, footage like right now we have a monitor set up right. so we can say you know if I lean out of frame I know what's happening but back then you wouldn't know until dailies so until you sat down in the theater at the end of the day if you did that. Not only that but there's also the element of um, the way they covered scenes. I don't know if how this movie was covered, but sometimes, mm -hmm. like right now, we have two cameras set up, so we're getting the coverage. Right. So you don't have to redo anything you say. Right. Um, but back then, I think a lot of times they used like the uh, the master coverage technique. Right. So you like cover the whole scene, and then you get all the close ups. So right. every every take was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so that yeah that that did lead to probably a little bit of inconsistency. I didn't notice right. any because I'm just like absorbed because old. Yeah. I'm used to the stylistic stuff of old Hollywood now. Yeah. And I think that, I think back whenever I first started watching it, I'd be like, ooh, the acting's a little off there. Ooh, that didn't quite match. But now I've seen so much that I don't even notice it anymore. Right. And it, it's weird to say that's a stylistic thing that you get used to, but it sort of is, I guess. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed it. I thought it was charming. Yeah. It, charming. It, it felt old, and I like that. Yeah. Um, when it felt old, so what, what sticks out to me always is more classical Hollywood or old feeling is... The camera movements, especially like we do those push-ins. Yeah, the, always very slow, kind very of. Very slow, like, and mm -hmm. it's always it's never anything. Obviously, we don't have steady cams or things. So we can't mm -hmm. do that. But even then, it's not never. It's always sort of locked off. Mm -hmm. And our one movement is every time there's an emotional scene, you push in. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think that that does date it. But I don't know. I like if I look for that, I notice it. But if I don't look for that, mm -hmm. it just sort of works. Yeah, it was well done. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'll get into the next question, which is. Obviously, we're recording this in February, the week before Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, sort of the, the love is in the air. So I, that's why I sort of picked this movie because I think there's tons of classic examples of romance films throughout mm -hmm. old Hollywood. Obviously, it's like love stories and the most told stories. But to me, this is one of the most interesting and best mm -hmm. because we so often associate old Hollywood with that idea of like, you gotta find the one. Right. Once you find the one, it all works out. Right. And this is very not that. Yeah. And how do you how do you feel about it as a romance story? Do you think it, it works? Do you think it provides an interesting take? What are your thoughts on it? I thought angle? it was really I thought it was really well done, especially with the openness of it. Like it was very there was even a line about being open minded yeah. in it, and that was an interesting take on it. Um, for being 
a romance story, it was interesting seeing her reaction throughout it. Like, you know, I liked how it revealed things over time. Mm -hmm. You weren't quite sure where it was going to go on the first yeah. watch. Like, it, and it made more sense because it, it mirrors the, the middle part of the movie where they have the flashback when it was Paris, right? That was being invaded by Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, when Paris is being invaded and she leaves, uh, she doesn't show up at the train station. That mirrors when he sends her off. Yep. Making it a very similar choice, but this time it wasn't her choice. And the idea of doing something for a greater good and having to sacrifice, uh, you know, romance for that. Yeah. And I haven't seen a whole lot of content that dive into that. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Andor has done that recently. Okay. I really enjoyed that. Okay, I haven't seen that yet. I mean, I don't know if I will because it's TV. But it's good. But if I do, that that's an interesting angle. Because I do think there is something, because especially in our modern times, we think so much of like, we don't think so much in the terms of the one, but we do very much mm -hmm. get to that attachment, that sort of idea of yeah. what I want is I want a relationship and I want it to work out and I want to be happy all the time and everything. Mm -hmm. But this sort of goes to that thing of, well, it's not really about you. It's also about the other person and about the broader society, Yeah. which we, I don't know, in my feelings, we don't take that into account as much anymore. I think it's ultimately about commitment because yeah. what he wanted, what he felt, you know, like betrayed because she wasn't as committed to him. And when he learned about she was just going for her commitments, her previous commitments, mm -hmm. he understood more. Yep. So. Yeah, and I also, I do really like, there's no, I mean, maybe you can sort of say like, you can point to La La Land and stuff as mo more modern examples of like love never like going, it, does, it goes mm -hmm. away, it doesn't really go away, it just changes form. Yeah, I haven't and, seen it yet. I know, yeah, if you haven't <laughs> seen La La Land, I'm sorry. Um, you, that, you need to. Um, but I think this is another great example of the love never goes away between them. Like we always treat it like it's in, end or all or be all. But this is very much sort of an open deal where it's like mm -hmm. you can come in, you can come out. And I like how he, at the end he sort of has that moment where he tries to like restore her husband's like faith mm -hmm. in, in their relationship. She's like, no, 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 no. Which I found interesting because those two characters are so comfortable knowing that they love each other and still love someone else. Right. But it's still important for society at large to have that sort of more open commitment. Yeah, I think yeah. it's because they knew it was a really tough situation. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, their commitment, the point at the end of the movie, ultimately their commitment was to, uh, you know, a bigger, a greater good. Yeah. Which calls into interest, uh, ultimately... What was the, the woman's name? Uh, Ilsa. Ilsa? Yeah. I felt like she she was just kind of going wherever things took her mm -hmm. uh, towards the end. The fact that she wanted to stay. Maybe the, the fact, it was interesting that she wasn't as committed as they were. Yeah. The male is always sort of leading it a little bit. Right. And I wonder if that was just a, written because of just the views on sex at the time and the gender at the time. Or maybe that just was more common in society then but I have a feeling it's probably that but the yeah. one thing that did stand out to me on this viewing while we talk about sort of gender dynamics is um Bogart is like looked up to as like one of the masculine figures mm -hmm. and you can sort of tell that the film he's, he's alcoholic he's got his emotions a little bit reserved mm -hmm. but I, I was saying about how could you you could almost frame this movie as like a man learning to become like I guess what we would like to find as a traditional manly man learning to be in touch with his more feminine emotions. And you can sort of mm -hmm. say that he's becoming a more modern man in the process. Because you think about the beginning, right? He doesn't want anything to do with the war. He's very mm -hmm. closed off. But then as he begins to open up to the idea of love and he opens up to the fact that it's hurt him and he sort of lets that, he's like, yeah, it hurt me, and puts that out in the open, he then mm -hmm. starts to do more good and he starts to care about people more. And I think that's an interesting angle especially when we talk about like Bogart and the Maltese Falcon and all these other movies where he's just like this guy he drinks he comes in the room he throws a whole bunch of one-liners and beats everyone up mm -hmm. there's something interesting like that character's vulnerability here in masculinity I don't know I don't have a full thesis on it but I think there's something mm -hmm. to say there yeah because he uh it's also interesting to look at because he did have hope before mm -hmm. but it was how crushed he was from her leaving Mm -hmm. How betrayed he felt was part of the reason why he was like that. It was him finding hope again. Yeah. So I don't know what more that says about. That is true. That sort of throws a little bit of the wrench in the masculinity idea, but it does say it's like it still still doesn't. It throws a little bit of a wrench, but I still think there's that yeah. element of before he was by banking that emotion, he wasn't mm -hmm. dealing with it. And if you don't deal with it, it comes out in this sort of 
And not usually we think about it in modern terms of like modern like masculine violence or aggression, but here it's much more like masculine reserve that you should be doing something but you aren't. Um, yeah. I think that's interesting. Um, well, what, what do you think that he should be doing that he wasn't? I think hurt? I think it's helping out that he has he's mm -hmm. in that position to help that he yeah. has he has the ability and the connections that he could be helping the war effort subtly, but he's just staying out right. of it instead. It's ultimately being selfish selfish versus selfless. Yeah, and I think that. Uh, comes back to the idea of love is what is it is it's, it's not a selfish thing or what i want and how you make me feel but it's a communal thing it's about being selfless yeah um i know we touched on the actors earlier uh and we touched on how great the performances are and i think that's yeah. another part that both dates the movie but also really makes it special yeah the performances performances are great and the, it was well written there are a lot of oh, really yeah. witty lines in there that just made it just really fun to watch yeah it's always quick one-liners quick mm -hmm. one i don't know where dialogue like that went i don't know why it's not Mm -hmm. You want to say you it's don't know why easy. it's not done? It's not easy at all, at all. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've ever tried to write it, but I've tried to write it, and mm -hmm. it always just comes out sounding too cliche. Because you got to have someone that can really sell those sort of cheesy lines, right? And it's hard. Um, but I think what really stood out on this watch was like the bit characters, like the character actors and stuff. Right. Like we don't have those moments of highlighting them as often as we do anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was all the side characters that made it feel more alive. Mm -hmm. And like the woman who came to him begging for help or asking if Renault could be trusted yeah. and he went and helped her, it, that obviously was, you know, further to build up his story and the way he feels. Mm -hmm. And that was an important part because he was at a crossroads of what to do. Yep. And it reminded him of who he was and what he could be doing. And he decided to help her. Did and you? it was everything celebrating that he helped her mm -hmm. really just kind of, I think, Maybe he was just getting a little addicted to that celebration too. Maybe remembering what it was like to have that. Yeah. And I assume that's why he went and you know had the French national anthem. That's what they were playing, right? Yeah. The, playing the French national anthem when the Germans are playing. I assume their national yes. anthem. I assume this. I, I believe those are both the national anthems. There's always a chance I'm wrong, but yeah. I'm not super familiar with either. But I do think it's interesting because without that moment, wouldn't it have worked? Well, A, did you notice that that couple appears multiple times before they talk to Rick? Did you notice that? Mm -mm, no, I, I did have a feeling that if you watched it again, you'd yeah. see more things in the back. There were little things in the background. Like, oh, yeah. At one point, I believe it was one of the Nazi officers was outside, mm -hmm. and there was a woman wearing his hat, and he was talking to her. Yep. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah. That was when... It's like that little stuff. Forgot when. It's yeah. that little stuff you missed that helps so much to build a world but yeah that mm -hmm. couple appears like in the very beginning you hear them say mm -hmm. like like looking around like they're new there and then you hear them ask someone else like where can we get a passport okay and then later you see like it's like a painting shot and like, right. like briefly in it i think i remember that but it's like interesting that it's like it's it's all these little moments that build the world because now we so often focus on like i mean it's the age of marvel and stuff not that those movies are bad but it's a very different way of storytelling where it's focused yeah. on the lore and like that, the background characters you feel could be main characters, but here it's very much like, no, it's a community effort across all parts, that even if you have one or two lines, that you're gonna kill those one or two lines. Right. Uh, and I think the greatest example of that is my, like one of my favorite actors, Peter Lorre, who plays the guy who gets killed very in the beginning, who stole yeah. the papers. He's just so nervous, and I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but I've loved him in everything he's in. And it's I just, the way he moves his face. It's the way he moves his face, but the whole brow moves, mm -hmm. and he yeah, sort of he, feels. He kind of does that with Yeah. Thing. It's very weird, but it, it's like even like great actors like him who've starred in all-time classics like him, they appear as bit parts and then they do mm -hmm. great. And I, I don't know how like, they're able to pull off that much. And I can't mm -hmm. imagine like, there's I, I heard a quote somewhere and they said if you handed in the Casablanca today, like it would never get made. Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting point because I'm like, what, what wouldn't work about Casablanca today? Like if you think about it being dated or old or it feels a little old, but we still enjoyed it. Mm. But what do you think, like, if you were to hand this script into someone today, had De Casablanca never existed, what do you think would be their first comment back about, like, changes to the pacing of the script or what works or what doesn't? Huh. I don't know. It, it's, it's a well-written movie. It's really mm -hmm. enjoyable to watch. Uh, well, obviously, first of all, it would be very expensive to make a period piece in the 1940s. Yeah. When was that movie made? 1940s. So it was, it was all right, it was made 1942. Yep. It was during the war. And it was set in 1942 during yeah. the war. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were making a movie about their time, so it was easier, it was cheaper to make that. Yeah. So, I guess uh, an equivalent of a Casablanca today might be something to do with the war in Ukraine. Yeah. But you, you could make that work. You okay. could. Or if a World War Three happens, mm -hmm. we, we can make Casablanca too. When it happens. <laughs> when it happens. <laughs> but I, I do think that's one thing. But, like, 
a period piece, obviously period pieces aren't made as often anymore. Mm -hmm. I think there is something to say about like that that drive that has made this movie. It's a piece, it's, it is propaganda, but at the same time, that element of like, we all need to come together and unite to defeat yeah. the common enemy. Uh, that, the common enemy doesn't really exist anymore fully. Yeah. So that would make it hard to make. Um, mm -hmm. One yeah. one self-report personal issue that I, not issue that I have with the movie, but it made me reconsider my position on things, was um, and like reading other people's scripts a whole lot, and I did this to Winston. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day was that like they'll put flashbacks in the middle of the movie and I always mm -hmm. am like get rid of it like let's just stay on the main plot thread like get rid of it let's just stay on the main plot thread that's fair and I think that that's it's so interesting that I do that now watching this and I go if I wonder if I would have handed this script if I would have said why do we have this flashback we understand they're involved right but without it it wouldn't be like you wouldn't understand to the level so I wonder right. I it made me go I need to be more careful about that whenever I give that note to people now yeah um, and it was just so weird to notice. It's like even stuff like that's changed like flashbacks How often do we really see flashbacks anymore? Yeah, not often. Not it's, often. It's not very common anymore uh, I wonder why do people shy away from flashbacks now? What What is it that makes I people think, hesitant? I, I think it, it might have cheesy It's cheesy and I think it might have started with Casablanca and all the other noir movies because mm -hmm. a lot of this one doesn't have it But a lot of noir movies have voiceover. They're like Mm -hmm. They're like staring at right. the drink and they're like it was a sad rainy Tuesday and then it's mm -hmm. like begins yeah. and then it goes into the flashback Which is how like detour starts. It's like him staring at a cup of coffee like that mm -hmm. and I think the overuse of that over time of like that flashback going into stuff mm -hmm. just killed it um, I could be wrong. Maybe there's like a bigger reason why but I, I feel like just narratively like everyone was like Oh, we're gonna go back in time again mm -hmm. I bet there's one movie that overdid it and pissed everyone off and that just sort of killed it Yeah, I don't know what that one movie is but I bet it exists out there somewhere mm -hmm. Time to bring back flashbacks. I know well Yeah, that's pretty much everything I write is fully in flashbacks too. True. So it was sort of a it was also like a I shot myself on the foot, like people hand me their scripts and I cross out the flashbacks mm -hmm. and whenever I hand them a script it's nothing but flashbacks and there's no mm -hmm. no present. I'm like, I'm like my own worst enemy. I, I do everything that I it's hate. It's different if it's only flashbacks. It's yeah, it's like, I need to, like, well that was the moment where I go, I need to find balance. Like it can't <laughs> be all or nothing, like there has to be a middle ground here. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about the bit parts, uh, Bogart, I think this is probably, like this and Maltese Falcon are probably his two biggest roles. Mm -hmm. So obviously we have to sort of discuss the Bergman and Bogart. So mm -hmm. Bergman plays Ilsa, Bogart obviously plays Rick. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you feel about them as like, let's say stars above all the other people? Because we already obviously have all these great actors intermingling, but how do, how do you think those two stand out? Like they have a unique presence, but I don't know quite right. how to phrase it. I guess uh, the character plays Rick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's his name again? Humphrey Bogart. Bogart. So Bogart just, you know, he has the Classic, like masculine, like I don't give a shit, like oh I cussed. Uh oh. <coughs> You're getting demonetized, dude. <coughs> You're fine. He has the classic masculine, like, oh I, I cope with my feelings by drinking and uh, you know, my hatred for women is like that of the sun. And, yeah. Like Well, obviously not. Well, I I guess kind of. Like kind he's of. taking out the woman at the beginning. Like he he just <coughs> He doesn't have time for emotional connection. He's not emotionally available in any way. Yeah, and it's because he it, closed himself off. He's completely closed off. And I think that comes back to that idea of masculinity is that there, it's not closed off, it's open. You have to still have that openness. Well, he was pretty open to uh, people in his life that you know are yeah. close, like the people working with As long with as him. it involved money or something else. Mm -hmm, but right. the relationship stuff, not as much. Yeah, anything else, is it didn't matter to him. And that's it all opened up when he saw her, who she plays more of a, you know, I I can't quite put my finger on what she represents. I guess she represents, um, because she, she represents like commitment to... Does she have to represent anything or is she just a character? I think that like, I don't think, I think that that's someone that we bring in it into these older movies as modern audiences. It's something I had to like detrain myself of mm -hmm. is that we... Especially with A24 movies, and I, you know how I feel about a lot of those. <laughs> but um, they, we come in with this idea that you know characters have to be a one to one. But mm -hmm. I think I think back in the day it was so much more. Whenever I watch stuff like this, it's almost never alleg. It's like there's an allegory there, right? But it's just accidental to what they were trying to do. Is this is just a person or a character? There was still that subtext. So obviously we have the propaganda angle, mm -hmm. but is it really subtext? It's pretty in your face. So it's like most of the time. I don't know, characters the representing stuff feels sort of loose within the framework of a lot of older movies. Like, it's never... We, we bring that to it, it doesn't bring that to us, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. 
But I definitely think if we were to look at it masculine-wise, there is definitely something there. Yeah, where was her character from? What was her character's nationality? I'm assuming French. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I, I thought so too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm probably reading into it too much. <laughs> what were you going to say then? <laughs> I guess, like, uh, on one hand, it almost feels a little inconsistent that she started, she regretted going with, um, oh my god, what's his name? The other guy. The the guy who was running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's I his know, name? I, I just, it's, I'm not going to lie. Okay. It's blanking right now. Well, she <laughs> initially ran to go be with him, but they implied that he needed her at that moment. He was sick. He genuinely needed help at yeah. that moment. So I, I guess it lines up in the end that she would want to stay with Rick at the end because, uh, you know, she was doing what she had to do. She felt like she was called to something bigger. And, yeah, that's it. Okay. I, I might think of more in a minute. Yeah, I think, it, I think there's definitely something about commitment and how their relationship is done mm -hmm. is that, like, you, we talk a lot, of, like, I've had discussions and I've done readings and stuff about this recently. Is like, is it, like, falling into love and you just abandon everything that before, like, you know, mm -hmm. if you're married to someone but you fall in love with someone new, do you just abandon that because love can change or whatever? And I think this is, I, I don't personally see it that way and I don't think a lot of people do, but I think there's very much, like, a an element to once you're into something for a while, love, ha love occurs over time mm -hmm. and that she's had a much longer time with him. It might not look the same, but it means the same in the long run. Yeah. Um, and I think there's something to be said about that there. I think there's a lot to be said about that there, but obviously we just finished it like, what, 20 minutes ago? So yeah. we're not going to have opi like fully formed opinions on it. Yeah, well, what I was thinking before coming in and watching this was how interesting it was that this was made during World War II mm -hmm. and just imagining what audience's reactions were to the movie at the yeah. time. That, that feeling of like uncertainty, like we don't know how the war is going to go. We don't know if Germany's going to win. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Also, there was, there were a lot of Americans that supported Germany at that point. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Nazis actually based a lot of how they worked and how, how they operated on the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So there, there were ties there. So, you know, it'd be interesting to go back and look and see what people's reactions were at that point. Mm -hmm. Not only from people who liked it, but people who hated it. Then. Yeah, that is true to do like a reception study. Because like we think about it now and it's almost more like an exotic tourism film in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we're going to a fun location uh -huh. and we're going to see some quirky characters. Yeah. And there's definitely that element of it. Like you have that all that oriental theme stuff that you mm -hmm. can get that little bit of like, oh, it's a travel film a bit. Yeah. But it's also like, is it like it's a travel film, but it's a travel to an important area yeah. in the war. I don't know Casablanca's actual history. I'm assuming that they did the research and it was mm -hmm. actually an important port. Uh, World War II is not my area of expertise history-wise, but I do think that there is something to be said there about just not knowing. And I think that's why we have mm -hmm. that ending we do, like where Rick helps out and then he's like, I didn't feel so good about our chances, but now I do, or whatever that yeah. line is. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's helpful. look at that audiences, like once we hop, America's in the war now, we'll hop in the war mm -hmm. and now all of our chances are better. What was uh, his, na Renault's nationality? Is he also French? French, yep. yeah. I yeah. thought so. And then there's that whole bit like with the Vichy regime and all that stuff, which Vichy was the mm -hmm. underneath, but not underneath Hitler, but like the, I don't know what his technical title was, but like the president of France mm -hmm. underneath Hitler. So everyone sort of hated him because it's like your work, you're a puppet, go it's a puppet right. government. The Vichy right. government was a puppet government. So I like that they like, it's an American movie, just very against France mm -hmm. the entire time. And I wonder also, well, A, France didn't see it because they were occupied by Germany. But it is quite funny looking back on it where like you have all these sort of like little nods to like he drops that bottle and kicks the bin. Mm -hmm. Or at the very beginning when the guy gets runs away and gets shot, the poster behind him says, I always keep my promises and it's the Vichy regime. Mm -hmm. It's all this sort of nods to just like the underlying violence there that just who feels is, who is the guy that got shot when I said I always keep my promises? It's the it's not it's the like very first guy. I remember they walk up to him, they're arresting all the usual suspects and he pulls uh -huh. out his thing and he goes where are your papers? He goes, oh, I don't have them. He goes, oh, well, never right. mind, I do. And then he goes, these are three months. He takes right, off right, right. whenever he gets shot. And that's the, there's a big poster on the wall that's like, mm -hmm. I always keep my promises. It says something else, too. But I thought I thought that was interesting. It was like, they're not going subtle, like, at all. Yeah. And not only they're not going subtle, but, like, nowadays we wouldn't openly attack other governments like that. Mm -hmm. So while we while we think about, like, it being so old-fashioned in, in ways, like, with mm -hmm. some of its representations of women and, and gender dynamics and all that sort of stuff, and its general, like, push to unifying all that mm -hmm. in a war effort there is still that element of like it is a little bit out there for just being in your face with some of that stuff oh yeah and i think like it might be classical in its stylings but there's definitely elements there that 
I don't know, to me that brings it life still. It's got this like chaotic, a little bit of a chaotic energy to it where it's like, it's not completely safe and by the numbers where you get those emotional pushings mm -hmm. and the story sort of played safe. It's got a little bit of the edge there. Yeah, especially with the plot point of like, you know, she loves someone else during that time and like the calling the question yeah. like, you know, the, I, I still love you so I'm gonna like send you on your way basically. Yeah, but the, the infidelity being fine in this case sort of. And all right. This, that's, that's, it, also made, it also made sense here. How could you, you know, even in a more conservative society where that wasn't yeah. okay, how could you go against justifying that? How could you like, yeah. because you know, he was, they, he, she thought he was dead. Yeah. You know, Holocaust. I wonder if there's, that, this might, like I said, this might be, re I know I just was all against like, the, 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 the they weren't writing the characters to represent anything, but I wonder if you could almost put a lens on this about like, um, the, if you think about it, Czechoslovakia was hit first, like pretty early on when I was mm -hmm. invaded and then France was next and then America was next on chopping block. Can you almost view, I wonder if you could view the relationship as Fra like France supported Czechoslovakia, but then Czechoslovakia was taken, and then France was taken, but then America supported France, mm -hmm. and then France was taken, and now it was all it was sort of a free for all. I wonder if you could view the relationship through the lens of almost the advance of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it really equates to anything, but I think that is something interesting. That we have that sort of like tears where it's like, who's next? America's next on the chopping block. We gotta, we gotta arm up and get ready to fight. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's something there. Maybe there's not, but. Even then, would America really be on the chopping block? No, I mean, like, they, they do mention That's London. London would yeah. be first, but... It was funny when he was talking about, like, uh, I, I, he was suggesting not to attack New York. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, there's, like, it's those one-liners, and I don't know... Mm -hmm. but I don't... Do you think we have modern stars like we do with, like, Bogart and, and Bergman? Because, like, you think about a... Her character's not on screen a whole lot, but she does have a presence that, like, even though... Technically speaking, if you're an audience at the time, she's in, like she sleeps around, she does other stuff, so we're not supposed mm -hmm. to like her, but you sort of instantly do. Mm -hmm. and the same thing with Bogart, like he's not the best guy, but his star power sort of overpowers that, and you're mm -hmm. just like, I'm on his side, I don't care. Yeah. Do you think we have actors like that nowadays, where we're just sort of like, they have a, you can't quite define what a star is, but it's he does sort of play himself, and so does she a little bit in almost every movie. But you have this, this ability to just, I'm on your side the minute you walk on screen. Do you think we have character like actors that are like stars like that today? Like I, I would you call a Timothy Chalamet a star like that? I don't, I don't know. I'm thinking of a uh, oh my god, what's his name? He was in Babylon, main one of the main characters in Babylon. Oh, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Yeah. Yeah. Brad Pitt has that power. Still. I think Brad Pitt has that power, and I think Margot Robbie is pretty close to that. Yeah. I'm curious about Timothy Chalamet because he's definitely like who, very. Who did he play again? In in what? Cause he's played in a lot. Give me, give me one role. Uh, Call me by your name, Dune. Oh, main Bones character. And all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he has that power too, but it's a little mm. bit different. He's, it's he's, different. He's a lot more select about his roles, so I wonder if there's a difference in star power, mainstream versus star power. Under, mm -hmm. like, he's not underground really, but like still, like he's more like it's a little bit different in his roles. But Brad Pitt's pretty selective too, so I don't know. Timothy also has been more of a awkward kind of I've only seen him in Dune. That's true. He has more of an awkward kind of vibe, but you still want to side with him. But also you side with him because of his character. Yeah. Like you're saying the characters in Casablanca, it's you're also the, it's the charisma it's the charismatic it. yeah. appearance and the way they put themselves oh yeah on the screen. That there's something about when they walk on screen there's just mm -hmm. they they just I ooze charisma back at you. Mm -hmm. Even if they're playing someone despicable. Like there's another movie uh, that I almost picked for this but it's mm -hmm. a little bit more extreme was um I always want to say it's called It's Happened One Night, but it's, that's not the one. It's In a Lonely Place with Bogart, and he plays an alcoholic screenwriter, and he abuses his girlfriend, cusses out people, does all sorts of horrible stuff, but you st like, you're like, you're horrible, but you still mm -hmm. sort of root for him and relate to him as he progresses and becomes a better person. Right. And it's like, can't, can't, like, Brad Pitt could probably do that. I got two actors okay. that I'm certain you'll agree. Oh, wait, no, you haven't seen it. Oh. Brian Cranston and Bob Odenkirk. Okay. Like Breaking Bad and, and uh, Better Call Saul. I, I think it's funny talking to people. It's like, when did you first realize Walter White was the bad guy? Right? Oh. It's, it's kind of a, especially when you're younger, if you watch Breaking yeah. Bad, it's harder to tell. Because when you're, on... you're on his side. Okay. You know, you're so invested in his story. But the longer you go on, like, wow, he's really horrible. The second time watching, it's like, huh, he was really horrible all along. Like, he never should have. Okay, so do you yeah. think that's the story or do you think that's the, the actor? Both. Both? Okay. Both, because I, in the case of uh, Walter White in Breaking Bad, he's always justifying what he's doing to yeah. himself and everyone mm -hmm. around him. Like, I have to mm -hmm. do this. And it sort of helps to justify uh, it. Yeah, it justifies it to the audience, too, yeah. because he's always justifying it to everyone around him. 
Bob, Bob Odenkirk, though, I do like that take. I do think that would be interesting because we put him in his lane. I have not, I have not seen Better Call Saul. What I know him from is like a couple like bit parts and Nobody. I haven't um, seen Nobody. Yet. Nobody's excellent, and I and I know somebody. I we had, I know I've seen a couple reviews. People like, oh, Bob Odenkirk. Somebody should. knows El Nobody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've seen a couple reviews. People like, oh, Bob Odenkirk shouldn't be in. Shouldn't be in nobody. Like he just stick stick, stick to your lane. You're not an action star. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. For me, he instantly worked in that part. Partially, mm -hmm. it was the casting. But I'm like, I wonder if you were to throw him in a couple more things, mm -hmm. and he would if he if you could build up a sort of star persona with him. I don't think he has it quite yeah. yet. Um, he got I, it for Better Call Saul. But he's got it. See that? I've seen that. Call Saul. And if he has it in Better Call Saul, then he has it. But I'm curious. Because yeah. they always do play versions of themselves too. I think that's another part of the stars is that yeah. they switch roles, but. You're not really watching for the role, you're watching for them. Yeah. And I, I don't think that, I think st it's weird because Star's lives are so much bigger now. Right. But they're almost more private, like we don't yeah. care as much. Bob is decently like his okay. characters. Okay. Uh, you go watch Mr. Show, because he got to start in comedy. Okay. And he, he wrote Mr. Show with David Cross. Okay. They wrote the show together, and you see that Bob Odenkirk's personality is pretty similar to his characters in a lot of ways. He's kind of out there and a little goofy and okay. watch some interviews with him too it's also like that okay so our vote for modern movie star is bob odenkirk yes bob odenkirk is that. the modern humphrey bogart yes um, but he's not uh, enough stuff though there's just it's like tarantino said the people go for the characters rather than the actors yeah, I think that is, mainly i think that's part of the choice too like back then like you were gonna go see whatever picture right so i think there's a choice now that we 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 have that we did back then yeah yeah okay to round it out, as I know we just discussed a whole bunch and jumped around and went on mm -hmm. a little tangent there. Overall thoughts. Would you recommend Casablanca? Oh yeah, of course. Do you it's think really it, good. Do you think it's an essential piece of like film history, essential film that everyone do you think everyone should see it? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Especially if anything, just to think about the, the climate at the time. Oh yeah. And just to remember what happened during World War Two and what people were thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go read more after this about what people's reactions were to this movie. Yeah, That's what I'm really curious. You about. got me thinking about that too. So whenever you do that, mm -hmm. shoot me a text. But yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. I would recommend it. Obviously, I did recommend it to you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big Bogart fan, so I would say if you like this, check out some of his other stuff. But this is probably like his his one like his massive hit. Mm -hmm. um, there yeah. was a lot of cinematography I really appreciated. Oh yeah, like the. Uh, I know it was at the end of the movie, so it's easy to remember, but the plane going by, mm -hmm. them standing like right here and right here, plane going over, uh, them walking off, uh, just how dense many of the shots oh, were. Oh yeah, there's always so much <clears throat> going on, but it's mm -hmm. still so simple that it's simple moves, simple mm -hmm. this. And I think that it that, makes sense. that it makes sense and that simplicity allows for all those little bits to shine. What's important I, is the characters, so. Yeah. I love the, the scene where, uh, what was the name of the pianist? Uh, I forget his name. Oh gosh, now your, your, your character names are well, the death of me. He, he's bringing up his piano. Uh, initially, the piano is more like this towards the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's talking to Bogart to yeah. uh, whatever his name was. Rick. Yeah. He's talking yep. to Rick. Rick has his drink. He's hunched over. He's he's dealing with his feelings. Yep. And he's like, you stay. The, the dialogue was just so good. Too. It, it's it just snappy back and forth it made sense it, it doesn't was... quite hit the topic but it sort of touches mm -hmm. on it so you yeah know where they're, they're going yeah you know where they're going he's obviously like kind of skirting around the topic but obviously bringing up like you going to bed are you going to sleep tonight <laughs> like yep. well i'm not a movie right here <laughs> and he, i love when he says that he pulls the piano out a little bit more so it takes up more of the screen yep and he starts playing and he starts demanding the song that was really funny yeah and it's just those like those little like the, every character no matter how long they're on screen you feel like they have a history with other people mm -hmm. and so yeah especially if i guess if you're an actor i would definitely say this is probably one to check out if yeah. you're a screenwriter definitely check this one out there's just all that little nuance mm -hmm. it's like how did they i was just saying that the whole time fascinated with how they managed to write this in the script like did all yeah. these lines appear in the script did all these little things happen I think there's just something really special about how, however it was made. Might not have been able to be made today. We don't, couldn't quite come down and answer on that. But yeah. when it was made, it was great and it still is great. So uh, yeah, go watch it if you haven't. And uh, that'll be episode two. So thank you, Ion. And uh, yeah, handshake, business yes, deal. Sir. This is yes, a sir. business deal. We'll, business. Trade, we'll trade cash mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you to the people behind the, the cameras. And uh, that'll be episode two. Shit. Sure.